today. Our first speaker is Farah Zia, and she got her MD degree at George Washington University, and she did a residency there and also at Holy Cross Hospital, and then she came to NCI as a... Uh, Medical uh, officer. <laughs> That's a what? Medical officer. Medical <laughs> officer, she says. <laughs> and now she sees lots of patients in the uh, women's malignancy branch. Her title today, Breast Cancer Overview, Prevention, Diagnosis, Treatment. Vera. All right. Thank you, Terry. Um, is my voice carrying? You can hear me? Okay. All right, so today the topic is breast cancer, and uh, it's, a, it's a vast area, so I'm going to touch a little bit on prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, so you're not going to get a lot in, every, in a specific area. It's kind of an overview lecture. Um, so we'll start by what is breast cancer? So the breast, as you can see here, is composed mainly of fatty tissue, but uh, Within the fatty tissue, there's an intricate network of lobules and ducts, which carries milk to the nipple. And it's within the lobules and the ducts that the majority of breast cancers arise. And also within the fatty tissue, you have um, blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. So the precise reasons why a particular woman will develop breast cancer are difficult to really specify, but we do know that it's a combination of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. And we do know that hormones um, have an important role um, in developing specifically hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Um, some of the known risk factors are uh, age. Uh, we do know that the majority of breast cancers arise in, arise in postmenopausal women. Um, also, if, if a woman has had a prior breast cancer, that definitely puts her at a much higher risk to develop a second breast cancer. Um, also, if a woman, woman has a history of benign breast conditions, either with or without atypia, that also puts uh, them at a higher risk. Um, and of course, exposure to excess endogenous or uh, exogenous hormones. Um, through either early menarche, late menopause, use of hormone replacement therapy. Um, and uh, if a woman has not had any pregnancies uh, until the age of 35 or, or older, um, and that's interesting, nobody understands really why, and that's because your breast cancer cells don't actually mature until your first pregnancy. So until then, they're actually very vulnerable to the effect of hormones. Um, also, uh, radiation exposure before the age of 40, for example, women, um, the, the minority who've had radiation for Hodgkin's lymphoma in the chest area, uh, we've seen breast cancer developing in those uh, patients. Also, if you have dense breast tissue on mammograms, so what is the reason for that? That is because if your mammogram is showing you have dense breast tissue, it's, it means that you have more glands rather than fatty tissue. So you are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Um, and also the dense breast tissue also, it's a little hard to visualize lesions necessarily on the mammogram. So they could be lurking somewhere and you would not see them. So lifestyle factors also, alcohol we know increases your estrogen levels. It also causes DNA damage. Um, also, lack of exercise is a risk factor. Uh, exercise, we know, consumes blood sugar, and it also limits insulin uh, growth factor, which is a hormone that can affect breast cell growth. Um, obesity also is a risk factor because there's extra fat cells, and that's more estrogen in the body. So we know cancer arises from gene mutations, and there's two types of mutations. Uh, Germline mutations uh, are present in the egg or sperm, and they cause hereditary cancer syndromes. They pass from parent to child. Uh, this is uh, a cause of 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers. And um, then there are somatic mutations, which occur in non-germline tissues. They are non-inheritable, and they are the result of um, basically the natural aging process or exposure to environmental carcinogens. So here you can see a, represent, a representation of frequency of gene mutations in breast cancer patients in a cohort of North American women. 
In blue, you see uh, that is uh, representative BRCA1. The orange is BRCA2, and that makes up the majority of um, breast mutations. However, there are other genes, and the majority are in, um, involved in DNA repair. Um, and there are also some tumor suppressor genes. Uh, it should be noted that if you have a BRCA, BRCA mutation, you have an up to 72% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Um, and uh, P53, that's a tumor suppressor gene, the cancer risk is nearly 100%. So the American Cancer Society says that in the United States, women have a 12.4% lifetime risk of developing invasive breast cancer. Um, and men will have a 0.1% lifetime risk. Um, the predictions for 2019 are that 268,000 cases of new invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed, and 41,760 women will actually die in 2019 of their disease. Uh, that's a huge number. And so as far as new cases being diagnosed, um, breast cancer is actually uh, second to uh, skin cancer, only second to skin cancer. And for mortality, it's only second to lung cancer. So the incidence um, it has been rising. Uh, the incidence of breast cancer in the U.S. has been steadily increasing basically since the 1970s. Um, and that actually can be attributed because there has been a stronger push for screening. So it's mainly detection, early detection that's likely causing the um, increase. Um, then around 2000, there was a slight decrease in the incidence, and uh, theoretically that could be due to the fact that that's about the time the Women's Health Initiative study was reported, and we realized that giving hormone replacement therapy was a risk for breast cancer. So th that was something that was completely eliminated, and there was a slight decrease. Um, the mortality rate has been declining, and uh, that is likely due to advances in treatment, early detection, and increased awareness. So looking at incidence and mortality by race, um, for uh, white females and African-American females, there was a steady and sharp rise in the incidence, which is depicted on the top graph. Um, but the incidence has always been higher for white females. There, it, there was a plateau uh, towards the end, um, around 2000 between 2005 and 2010. Um, but again, white females are still at a much higher incidence. Um, the mortality is declining for both, but it can be noted that uh, African-American females unfortunately still have a higher mortality rate. So October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So since I do the lecture in this month, I always like to touch a little bit on early detection. So I just want to say mammograms, save lives, um, and I cannot stress that enough. Mammograms can be used as screening tools to detect cancer when there are no symptoms um, involved, and mammograms can also be used to detect and diagnose uh, breast disease, breast cancer, um, when a woman is having symptoms. It reduces mortality by 26% in the older, the older age group, 50 to 74, and 17% in the ages 40 to 49. Um, the majority of uh, breast cancers are actually diagnosed uh, after menopause, so that's the reason for that discrepancy. So the guidelines right now for a woman who is at average risk from age 40 to 44, women have the choice to begin annual mammograms. Uh, from 45 to 54, we, uh, the American Cancer Society does recommend it. Uh, 55 and older, they have the option of switching to biannual, but it depends, again, on the risks and the family history, and all of those things have to be taken into consideration. Uh, for women who are considered high risk, uh, the recommendation from the American Cancer Society would be an annual MRI and mammogram, both in combination. And high risk is determined by using some sort of a, a risk assessment tool that takes multiple factors into consideration 
And it's for those women who using those tools, if they have greater or equal to 20, 20 to 25% um, a risk of uh, developing cancer, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Um, so just uh, some notes about the MRI uh, and its use in early detection. While MRI is more sensitive than mammogram, it also has a higher false positive rate. Um, and this may lead to unnecessary biopsies and other procedures. And that is why the American Cancer Society does not recommend it for those who are in the low or moderate risk group and only for those women who are in the higher risk group. So a couple notes about the clinical breast exam and uh, the self-breast exam. I think uh, uh, this is very interesting. There is no solid clinical trial evidence that a physical breast exam done either by a physician or by the woman, women themselves provides any clear benefit in early detection or reducing breast cancer mortality. So because of this technical lack of evidence, um, regular clinical breast exams and breast self-exams are not part of the ACS guidelines um, because guidelines are usually developed according to evidence. They're evidence-based guidelines. But I, I want to stress that you know, despite that, I think all surgeons, all physicians, all medical oncologists, we all feel that clinical breast exams are effective when you look at each individual rather than the, you know, the masses. And so all women, I believe, should be familiar with how their best look and feel, and they should report any changes to their physician. I think this is um, imperative in, in early detection. So since this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, just quickly, uh, this is the self-breast exam. You would, uh, some people like to um, do it on a monthly basis, correlating with their menstrual cycle, and that's how they don't forget. But the first step would be to st uh, stand straight, look in the mirror, shoulders straight, arms on hips, and look at uh, any changes in size, shape, color, dimpling, puckering, retractions. You would know a change. Uh, you do the same thing with your arms over your head. And then you do it lying down. You use a firm, smooth touch. Uh, it doesn't matter really how you do it. You just want to check all areas and follow a pattern and cover the whole breast. That's all. And then you do the same thing with uh, your uh, standing upright with your arms above your head so you can uh, feel for the lymph node area as well. So when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, it is definitely a journey, and a journey that takes you to many stops. Um, first, uh, of course, an abnormality is detected, either on self-breast exam, by the physician, by the patient themselves, or on breast imaging, something is noted. So the next step would be to have, um, I guess, a, a biopsy, but a, a biopsy that's a, a fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy using a needle. Um, it can be image guided if, if it's not palpable. And then that, after that, we get the pathology, um, initial pathology, and then patient goes for a surgical consultation. Um, and then, so here, sometimes we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy before a surgical procedure is done. Sometimes we, if the area, if the mass in the breast is too large and we'd like to shrink it, we'll give uh, chemotherapy before surgery. But more often than not, the patient will go to, uh, to the surgeon, have a surgical procedure, which could be a lumpectomy, which is a wide excision of the area where the, um, the mass is. If it's not palpable, it could be a wire localized excision where the interventional radiologist or surgeon will place a wire using image uh, guided techniques and then the surgeon knows exactly where to go when they go in and they excise the area or a full mastectomy. Um, lymph node uh, dissection, so there's two options. You can have a sentinel node dissection or axillary node dissection. These are the nodes that are important in breast cancer. Um, of course, you have your axillary chain, which is the most important. And then, of course, you've got the supraclavicular area, the subclavicular area, um, the mediastinal nodes, and the internal mammary nodes. Um, so 
obviously when a breast cancer becomes invasive, it breaks through the walls of the duct or the lobules where it began, moves into the tissue surrounding that, the stroma, and then it has access into the lymphatic system and can go travel to other parts, distant parts of the body. So lymph node sampling, so I said there's two methods, the sentinel node or the full accelerator dissection. Um, sentinel is obviously less invasive. Um, it is the current recommendation for pa patients with early stage breast cancer who are clinically node negative, meaning that we're not able to actually palpate or feel positive nodes when we examine the patient. So during surgery, isosulfan blue or technetium 99 is injected near the tumor or under the nipple. Um, the tracer and the dye mix with fluids, they travel to the lymph node. And then the central node is either the first node or the first group of nodes that receives the drainage. And those are the nodes that are taken out. Um, the idea is if those nodes are clean, then the subsequent nodes should be clean. The full axillary dissection, the benefit obviously is that you're, you're looking at all the nodes and you are uh, very clear that there is or is not any spread of the cancer. But the downside is definitely post-surgical lymphedema, infections, nerve damage, and it happens all too often. Unfortunately, I guess it would have been nice if I had a picture to show you, but, but definitely it's, it's very problematic for patients. Um, so after the surgery, there you have the final pathology report. Um, and, uh, you know, we also send things for our genetic workup these days. So following that, the patient goes to now see the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist to get a final plan. And in order to make a final plan, you basically have to know the stage. And so staging is an important tool to determine the prognosis and to determine how you're going to treat patients. And so I'm not going to go through everything here, but stage zero um, in breast cancer is known as carcinoma in situ, and it has, that's where it has not gone past the ducts or the lobules. And then stages one to three are based on basically uh, the TNM system, which uh, T is the size of the tumor, N is uh, whether the nodes are positive and how many are positive, and M is whether there is distant metastases or not. And you can take a look in your handout, but stage four, as we know that sadly, uh, when the cancer has spread to distant sites in the body, it's not curable, but actually these days, uh, we have good treatments and patients can do well for, for quite some time. Um, but for breast cancer, the most common areas of spread are the bones, the lungs, the liver, the chest wall, or the brain. I just wanna mention inflammatory breast cancer. It's a, it's a very different entity. Um, so it's a rare form of breast cancer. Its incidence in the U.S. is about 1% to 5%. Uh, but this may be underestimated because it's very difficult to track because there's variations in diagnostic criteria. Um, and sometimes it's misdiagnosed. But oftentimes you'll see malignant cells infiltrate and clog the dermal lymphatics. However, just to be clear, Dermal lymphatic invasion is not a diagnostic criteria for inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, you can actually see that in any breast cancer, but the diagnosis is mainly the clinical presentation of how the patient, how the breast looks, um, and the fact that you have a biopsy that confirms that there is invasive breast cancer. So a patient who has inflammatory breast cancer, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but you normally see a rapid onset of uh, changes in the breast over three to six months. There is erythema that covers uh, at least a third of the breast. And there's edema giving the skin a look of uh, look like an orange peel, the peau d'orange look. And you often see breast enlargement, but there's no mass usually that we can palpate. So here's an example. Uh, you can see the peau d'orange the erythema, because this is an African-American female, the erythema is not as appreciable, but you can see the peau d'orange appearance of the skin. Um, 
but you can also see how this may get missed as being diagnosed as a breast cancer. Here are other varied presentations. Um, these were all patients of ours at the clinical center. Um, so you can see, so like the top maybe it looks more like an infection, and the bottom somebody may say it's a rash. So these things, when patients go in, when it, when you, when a patient presents with inflammatory breast cancer, and they go see their primary care physician, oftentimes it can go on for some time because likely it's not first diagnosed as a breast cancer. Sometimes it can evolve if a patient has a breast cancer and things can in evolve into an inflammatory picture. Okay, so back to just treatment decisions. Um, so breast cancer is commonly treated with various combinations of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy. Um, so what are the things that we use to make our decisions? So prognosis and selection of therapy, we use these clinical factors. Um, whether the patient is now menopausal, what is the stage of the disease, as I previously said, the grade of the tumor, how aggressive is it, hormone receptor status, HER2 status, histological type, the patient's age, can they tolerate chemo? But now a huge thing is molecular profiling, and so that tells us the presence of mutations, and I'll talk more about that later. So this is a classic graph from the early breast cancer trialist group that was printed in the Lancet in 2005. So patients who are um, um, who received uh, polychemotherapy, it's, at, it's showing the benefit of polychemotherapy. Um, and polychemotherapy is basically treating breast cancer with more than one chemo uh, that targets different mechanisms. Um, so that's normally how we do it. We don't, in the adjuvant setting, when a patient has been first diagnosed and they have early stage breast cancer, we always treat with more than one regimen because our goal at that time is to cure. When the patient becomes stage four and metastatic, that's when we, dis we try to use single agents because at that point it's palliative treatment and we are trying not to give the patient too many toxicities and we also want to keep our arsenals, you know, in hand and not use too many things at one time. But in the adjuvant setting, there's definitely uh, an absolute risk reduction of relapse and mortality with polychemotherapy. And um, the recurrence you see in these graphs is on the left. The mortality is on the right. The top one is the younger women aged less than 50. And you can see the, the difference between the... Uh, the control and the uh, polychemotherapy arm, and you can see that the younger people have the greater benefit. These are just some examples of the chemotherapies that are used to treat invasive uh, ductal carcinoma. Um, so some are the, the first three are alkylating agents, uh, docetaxel, paclitaxel, they're microtubule inhibitors. The rest of them are um, anti-metabolites, so they, they have different mechanisms and we combine them uh, based on different mechanisms. Uh, these are examples of the many hormonal therapies that have been approved for early stage and locally advanced breast cancer. Um, tamoxifen is the oldest um, tried and true. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which means that it acts as an antagonist in the breast, but it acts as a partial agonist in the endometrium. Um, so there is a slight risk of endometrial cancer with, uh, with that. Uh, anastrozole, letrozole, exemestane are aromatase inhibitors. They are used in postmenopausal women. They act by blocking the um, aromatase, which is an enzyme that converts other hormones to estrogen. Fulvestrant is a pure anti-estrogen. And then gusarolin and loperolide, they uh, induce uh, ovarian suppression. So they block estrogen production from the ovaries in premenopausal women. Um, so uh, sometimes we can use that. We can use uh, ovarian suppression and then put the patient on an aromatase inhibitor uh, to when they are premenopausal. 
So this is also a very classic graph from the Lancet in 2005, early breast cancer trialist group. It's showing the benefit of tamoxifen in hormone receptor positive patients as the um, adjuvant treatment. Um, you can see that most of the, the, the graph on the left is showing benefit for recurrence, and the right is showing the benefit on mortality, breast cancer mortality. And you can see that the most of the effect on recurrence comes in the first five years. Um, and most of the effect on mortality comes after the first five years. But uh, there's definitely uh, a huge benefit for hormone receptor positive patients to utilize hormone receptor uh, treatment as adjuvant therapy, either with chemotherapy or following chemotherapy. But more recently, we also know, uh, as other hormone therapies have been developed, we know that uh, there is great, greater benefit to sequencing hormonal therapies. Um, so uh, in the postmenopausal women, we know that using five years of tamoxifen and then following it with five years of an aromatase inhibitor is more beneficial than just doing 10 years of tamoxifen. Um, so that is both on recurrence and mortality. These are examples of targeted therapies. The list grows every year that I do this lecture. I used to talk about each individual one, and as the years go on, I have to make a chart now because there's so many. <laughs> so trastuzumab uh, is a monoclonal antibody that binds selectively to the HER2 protein, and it suppresses activity that leads to cell pr proliferation. Pertuzumab um, binds to the extracellular, extracellular domain of HER2 and it inhibits uh, ligand-dependent HER2, HER3 dimerization. And therefore, it reduces signaling through PI3 uh, AKT pathway. Um, Adotrastuzumab amantacine, it's a combination of Herceptin bound to amantacine. So it basically delivers amantacine to cancer cells in a targeted way on, for patients who are um, HER2 positive. Um, Lapatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Avrolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. Um, Palbociclib, ribociclib, abemociclib, all three are CDK4-6 uh, inhibitors. They um, induce G1 arrest, and re uh, so the cell cycle does not progress. So that's their mechanism. And they are actually, so all of them are approved in combination uh, with um, an endocrine therapy, most of them with full vestrin, which is a pure anti-estrogen. Olaparib is a PARP inhibitor. Talazoparib is a PARP inhibitor. Um, these are the, so PARP inhibitors have not had the best of luck in breast cancer, uh, but these are the two that have been recently approved. Um, they're approved in BRCA mutated uh, breast cancer because BRCA, as you know, helps in DNA repair and, um, when, and the PARP enzymes also are DNA repair enzymes. So when you knock out both of them, then they're effective in, in uh, causing cell death. This is one that I added to my list. This is a first-in-class approval. Uh, this was just approved in May. This is, um, it inhibits uh, PIK3 in the PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, ultimately inhibiting the pathway activation. Um, so this is a completely uh, new drug class. Um, a lot of side effects, definitely. I, I've used it recently in some patients, and a lot of uh, diarrhea and uh, a lot of um, hyperglycemia. So a lot of side effects that are hard to manage, actually. But. OK, so how do clinicians make well-informed decisions about which patients to treat with chemo and what to choose? So well, treating patients uh, in the genomics era has changed quite a bit. Um, not only do we select chemotherapy chemotherapy regimens for patients, we also select patients for chemotherapy regimens, which is good. Um, so not only look, looking at the clinical indicators, as I mentioned up there, 
Uh, but we use gene expression profiling of the primary tumor to predict response to particular agents. And very importantly, we use gene expression profiling of the primary tumor to predict and treat only those patients who are most likely to recur and who will therefore benefit from, most, uh, from the additional chemotherapy. So these are assays that are actually approved by um, insurances and, and widely used now. So just in case somebody is confused, uh, what, are, what is the difference between genomic and genetic testing? So genetic testing involves sequencing a person's DNA uh, using blood or saliva. And genomic, uh, it's more of a terminology thing so people don't get confused. Genomic testing analyzes the actual tumor tissue itself. So uh, with genomic profiling assays, physicians are able to do risk prognostication. Um, uh, it gives us a predictive benefit of adjuvant chemotherapies. It, it um, gives us information on the likelihood of a cancer uh, that would be rapidly growing and metastasizing. It also helps us to identify actionable mutations. So this is a classic um, cluster dendrogram by Sorley that was printed in PNAS from back in 2001, and that's where it all started. Uh, they were able to look at um, tumor samples and to classify them into six categories, basically that had clinical relevance um, to, um, you know, basically relevance to prognosis and to therapies and. Um, so the question is, is molecular profiling useful uh, in determining breast cancer prognosis and treatment? And absolutely, yes. And even back then, when they looked at the overall survival uh, for the six established subtypes back in 2001, they clearly saw significantly different outcomes for the patients belonging to the various groups. Um, for example, the luminal A subtype appears to have the best prognosis, and basal-like has the worst prognosis. And then this is just showing, this is more recent, but it's uh, showing um, that definitely gene expression arrays can categorize breast cancers, and they can inform physicians about prognosis and therapeutic response. The luminal A's tend to be hormone receptor positive, which we know have a better prognosis. Um, the triple negative we know have a poor, poorer prognosis, and they are also P53 uh, positive, P53 mutated. So they fall along a continuum pretty well. So uh, definitely just uh, next-gen sequencing um, has made it possible to sequence large numbers of genes, and that's very helpful to the on oncology field. Um, so clinically actionable mutations, just to define it, are those that are prognostic, um, either prognostic, which means that they're correlated with behavior of the tumor, or predictive. That they're correlated with their response to a therapeutic agent. Um, some mutations are pathogenic. They're driver mutations, but they don't actually, um, they're not specifically actionable. And I just want to mention that, so what's important is that two assays have been approved by the FDA that analyze tumor RNA to predict recurrence and select patients for chemotherapy. The two that are FDA approved are Mamoprint and Oncotype DX. Um, these are actually in use um, in the clinical realm. So the Mamoprint assay uses microarray technology to analyze 70 genes, and it places patients either at a you know, low-risk category um, of uh, developing a recurrence or a high-risk category. So the ones who are low-risk, according to the test, they, they have a 10% chance of recurrence at 10 years. And those who are high risk, according to this assay, will be or have a 29% chance of recurrence at 10 years. And it's only able to be used in patients who have the criteria that are listed over there. And uh, this is approved back in 2007, and it's covered um, by insurance. Uh, it was validated by a study that showed when they used that particular assay and patients came out to be high risk, uh, and they received only endocrine therapy, they um, had a 76% uh, distant disease-free survival. But if they were high risk, according to the mammoprint, and they received both endocrine and chemo, they had an 88% distant disease-free survival. So uh, 
it, it, the, the test was validated and clearly there was a 12% uh, absolute benefit of adding chemotherapy to those patients who were deemed to be high risk. Um, this is actually a test that's more uh, in practice specifically because it's not only prognostic, but it's also predictive. It actually also predicts uh, the likelihood of benefit from chemo or radiation uh, treatment. So this is very important. Um, it, we, you know, physicians use it basically to prevent patients from getting uh, toxic chemo if we can avoid it. Um, so just a little bit about how it was developed. Uh, they used an RT-PCR method to basically quantify gene expression, and it was originally validated for patients who were ER positive, HER2 negative, node negative, um, with invasive cancer. But recently, it's also been extended to the node 1 to 3 node positive category as well. So they started with 250 candidate genes, and then from that, they uh, narrowed it down to those genes that had some sort of prognostic significance in breast cancer. Um, then finally, they narrowed it down to 16 cancer-related genes that fell into three categories, proliferation, um, ER-related, invasion-related, um, and they had five reference genes uh, and some housekeeping miscellaneous genes. So then they develop, developed an algorithm based on the levels of expression of these genes uh, to compute a recurrence score for each tumor sample being tested. And so this, the, the prognostic uh, ability of the oncotype was uh, validated. Uh, so those patients who actually, so they used a retrospective analysis of tissue from a previous study and so those patients who were categorized as um, having a, recur a low recurrence score had a lower rate of distant disease. Uh, they were uh, a lower rate of recurrence at 10 years. And it fell on a continuum. So uh, the test was validated for its prognostic value. Uh, they also wanted to look at its predictive value of chemotherapy benefit. So patients with tumors that have a high recurrence score have a large absolute benefit of chemotherapy. So the patients who have a risk score of greater than 31, you can see that the graph um, with and without chemotherapy is well separated. Those uh, patients with tumors that have low recurrence score have, have a minimal benefit from chemotherapy. But the big question is what about the group in the middle that has an intermediate score, recurrence score? What do we do with those patients? Do we give chemotherapy or do we not? You know, that was not an answered question at this point. So the Taylor RX study was uh, developed to answer that question. And this is a study that was led by ECOG Akron, but it was actually uh, led by the National Cancer Institute CTEP program. Um, actually, um, one of my mentors, uh, was uh, from when I was a fellow here, Dr. Joanne Zajuski was very involved in this uh, trial in its um, inception and design and concept. So basically, they enrolled 100,000 or 10,000 women with um, early stage breast cancer. And basically, so the ones that had a high recurrent score, they got chemo and um, hormone therapy as expected. Those with a low recurrent score, uh, they just got hormone therapy. But the question was with the intermediate group, what to do? And so that was the primary study group for this study. And they randomized them to either hormone therapy alone or to chemo and hormone uh, therapy. And so just last year, the results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was big news, actually, for the oncology community. Uh, this uh, is a survival curve, no, this, yeah, this is a survival curve here. And so there was no statistically significant difference in uh, invasive disease-free survival among patients in the intermediate group, whether or not they got chemotherapy. So chemotherapy did not benefit the group uh, the, in the intermediate group. Um, so for those who had a high recurrence score, despite the fact they got chemotherapy, they still had more events. As you can see by the red line, there was more, the mortality was clearly higher. 
um, but those with um, a low recurrence score receiving only um, only hormone therapy, it, you know, they were the risk of distant recurrence was only one percent at five years. So making hormone therapy alone an effective choice would for those patients. But the big you know, the big thing that was we learned from this was those that in the intermediate category, we uh, they do not derive benefit. And this is just showing recurrence. So there's no statistically significant difference between treatment groups in the probability of distant recurrence at nine years. So this is for those patients who have a recurrence score in the intermediate category. So the bottom line is that the oncotype uh, assay, uh, which was a long time in the making, I would say going back all the way to the Sorley thing back in 2001, the oncotype DX assay can identify 70% of women uh, with no chemotherapy benefit, as well as identify those in whom chemotherapy may be life-saving. Um, so those in the with the risk score zero to 25 if we had not used this assay 25 percent of women would have been over treated if we were simply going by clinical factors 25 percent would have been over treated we would have given them the toxicity of uh, chemo uh, which is not a small thing because alkylating agents can call, cause other cancers they can cause myelodysplastic syndromes um, and I've seen that in the clinic, and you know it's it's really sad. You you treat one cancer, and a patient is doing really well, and all of a sudden now they've got a leukemia. So it's not a small thing. Um, and then in the high risk category, twenty six the patients who had a risk score of twenty six to one hundred, this study showed us that um, if we went just by clinical factors and not molecular profiling we would have undertreated 43%. So we gave 43% pa more patients the benefit of something that could save their life. So this is huge in uh, breast oncology. So what are the clinical implications um, of molecular diagnostic diagnostics in breast cancer? So treatment is becoming more personalized for patients. Um, and we, we know that. And the next gen sequencing is increasingly, increasingly being used. Um, but what we don't know is if assigning treatment based on specific gene mutations can provide clinical benefit uh, as far as increasing overall survival. Um, so I guess in oncology, we look at everything in terms of overall survival. So that is an answer, that's the question we have not answered. And this is an avenue of ongoing investigation, and they're looking at different, we're looking at different combinations, and it'll take a while to get that answer. So um, I'm just going to talk briefly about one or two trials that we have in the Center for Cancer Research, Women's Malignancies Branch, just very briefly. Um, a little bit of background, um, programmed cell death uh, ligand 1, PDL1, has emerged as an important cancer biomarker and target for immunotherapy. Uh, targeted blockade of PDL1 may help restore or upregulate the anti tumor immune response. PDL1 is frequently expressed on tumor cells and tumor infiltrating immune cells within the tumor microenvironment. When PDL1 binds to PD1, which is expressed on activated T cells, it induces T cell exhaustion or a state of ineffective T cell activity. So you basically want to block that interaction. So PDL1 expressed on antigen presenting cells can also inhibit T cell activity by binding to CD80. So if you can inhibit that interaction, that is a way to target the cancer. So disrupting the PDL1 pathway, the blockade of PDL1 binding to PD1 reverses T cell exhaustion and strengthens anti-tumor activity, um, inhibiting the, the interaction with CD80 and um, PDL1 to PD1 interactions uh, of the T cell and tumor cell may restore the T cell cytotoxic activity. And uh, an agent, Gervalumab, is um, it's a uh, Immunotherapy, uh, it blocks PDL1 
binding to PD-1 and CD-80, and it's being investigated alone and in combination in a variety of cancers. So one approach in immuno-oncology is the combination blockade of multiple immune checkpoints uh, with small molecule targeted therapies. So in our branch, we have a trial for triple negative breast cancer that combines dervalumab with a PARP inhibitor. Um, so the preclinical justification for the combination is that studies have shown that PARP inhibitors actually will upregulate PDL1 expression uh, in breast cancer cell lines and animal models. Uh, the combination of PARP inhibitors and anti pdl one therapy increases the therapeutic efficacy in vivo uh, compared to, other, uh, to either agent alone. So, uh, what is, uh, so PARP inhibitors, uh, what is the, the rationale to use those in somatic or germline mutated breast cancer? Um, so in normal cells, the response to naturally occurring or induced DNA damage can be through either the, the BRCA pathway uh, or the PARP enzymes. So when BRCA1 or 2 is mutated, the cell is dependent on other mechanisms such as PARP. And in this instance, PARP inhibitors will cause a double, double hit to the cell repair mechanism and the cells will then accumulate damage and, and die. And then, uh, so PARP uh, is involved in base excision repair. BRCA1 is in, involved in checkpoint activation and DNA repair, and BRCA2 is involved in homo homologous double strand uh, repair. So, yeah, if you knock out all of these pathways, the, the cell is going to have trouble. So, we have um, a trial, and so basically, um, uh, we have two cohorts. Uh, so, in metastatic triple negative breast cancer patients, uh, they need to be measurable, uh, that means they're targeted lesions, we have to be able to see them on a CT scan and be able to measure so we can measure response and use resist criteria. Um, we have two cohorts, uh, one for BRCA wild type, uh, which are obviously not mutated, and one for BRCA mutated patients. The patients receive dervalumab 1500 milligrams IV on a 28-day schedule, and Olaparib is taken daily 300 milligrams twice a day. Uh, the primary endpoint for our trial is uh, response rate, and the secondary endpoints are duration of response, progression-free survival, overall survival, and toxicity. It's currently open and accruing. So I'm just going to do a brief case report of a patient on that trial. So the patient is a 37-year-old female of Dominican origin who noted a left breast mass on self-exam October 2016. Um, subsequent ultrasound showed a 2.6 by 1.6 by 2.5 centimeter irregular hypoechoic mass. Uh, no pathologic lymph nodes were noted. Ultrasound guided fine needle biopsy revealed infiltrating ductal carcinoma, pathological grade 3. Um, IHC was negative for ERPR, HER2 was negative by FISH, which makes it a triple negative breast cancer. Genetic testing indicated that she had a germline BRCA1 mutation. She was diagnosed with clinical stage 2B breast cancer. She began neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is uh, uh, chemotherapy before surgery, and she had dose-dense adriamycin and cytoxan uh, every two weeks, and she had four cycles of that, and that was followed by carboplatin and taxol, and she had that every three weeks for another four cycles. Then she underwent a bilateral mastectomy and a left sentinel node dissection. Um, and she did not have a pathological CR from the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, the best prognosis is when patients have chemotherapy before surgery, if there is no tumor that is visible at, uh, at pa the surgical pathology, that's the best prognosis. For patients who have residual tumor that's left, usually the prognosis is not as good. Um, so. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is actually one way to assess uh, response to chemotherapy because you can actually see the response. So the central lymph node was negative. Her pathological stage was T1B. So then she had a follow-up CT scan um, in September of 2018 that showed progression, unfortunately, with a large uh, mass in her left subpectoral region. It was 5.5 by 2.6 centimeters. Um, 
a left axillary lymph node that was 1.9 by 1.3 centimeters, or right, it was right hilar lymphadenopathy. That's um, uh, in the mediastinal area uh, where the heart and lungs are, and uh, innumerable um, lung nodules on both, both lungs. And she also had a 1.6 by 1.2 centimeter left hepatic lobe nodule and bone metastases. So the PET CT was done, and it showed that all lesions were intensely FDG avid. That means there was a high metabolic rate and likely cancer. Um, an ultrasound guided biopsy of the left subpectoral mass was consistent with recurrence of her breast cancer. It was still triple negative. On October 2018, she screened for our protocol. Uh, she began cycle one on November 5th. 2018, um, and a CT scan was performed after two cycles in, on January 7, 2019, and it showed a dramatic partial response uh, with a 50% reduction of size of target lesions in the lung and the liver. And after 10 cycles of treatment, she continues to have a dramatic response with the last CT in September showing 82% decrease in the size of her target lesions from baseline. So that's, that's amazing. And so here is just, um, this is one of her target lesions. This is from baseline, November 2018, before she started treatment. This is the mass in her uh, subpectoral area, 4.4 by 3.3 centimeters. It's marked off right there in, with the green. And after 10 cycles uh, in September, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, her last CT scan, there was no mass in the axilla subpec area. Nothing. And at baseline, she had a left lobe uh, liver mass, 3.7 by 2.8 centimeters. And here, after 10 cycles, you can hardly see, I think the radiologist called it as something like, um, two, like a millimeter or something. You can hardly see anything. This is her lungs uh, at baseline. All of the, the area in the, the middle, I mean, that you, that's the aortic arch, but you can see all, there's a lot of adenopathy near the heart uh, and in between the two lungs. Um, and those things you can see, in, it's, it's metastatic disease, basically. And so after 10 cycles, you can see that it's resolved. Well, before I go there, just uh, so. Out of all the breast cancer, the triple negative breast cancers are considered to be more immunogenic. They, it seems that they have a high infiltration of T cells. If you were to take a biopsy and take a look at it, you would see that more than likely they uh, have more T cell infiltration into the tumor microenvironment than other breast cancers. So that could be one reason they are more, um, and she was also BRCA mutated, so the PARP inhibitor was more effective in her. So just briefly, uh, just one or two slides left. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors are also an important area of targeted therapy. Um, checkpoint kinases one and two are cell cycle regulators. They halt the cell cycle at checkpoints to assess for mistakes and make, uh, make repair. Um, cells with a defect in this mechanism will accumulate damaged DNA and eventually die. Um, those tumors that already have mutations in DNA repair proteins are perhaps more susceptible to the effects of checkpoint inhibitors, like um, if there are, um, if a patient has a BRCA mutation, for example. And then, so this is a trial that we have. Um, the, the cohort for breast patients is now closed, uh, but we have yet to analyze all our results, but we had several patients, um, breast patients on this trial with good responses as well. But for sake of time, I did not put a case report for this one. <laughs> so that is it. There's some slides after that, but I'm not going to talk about that. So that's all. Sure. Any questions? So you have something going for the triple negative breast cancer now. Yes, uh, so triple negative is an area that uh, we definitely need to do more research on because there are minimal uh, choices except for chemotherapy. There's no, uh, you know, obviously we can't use hormones, it's very minimal choices. So targeted therapy, immunotherapies are the way to go. And it seems like immunotherapy seems to be effective. 
And in those that are BRCA mutated, uh, TARP inhibitors and such are very effective there. Yeah. So it's very promising. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you, Farah. Our next speaker is Jadira Del Rivero. She got her medical degree in Veracruz and she did a residency there and then she came to the States. She worked in New York doing an internal medicine residency and she completed a fellowship in endocrinology. Then she came to NIH and participated in the Inter-Institute Endocrinology Training Program and uh, she has a lot of experience. <laughs> well, I, I, I did a lot of training, let's put it that way. <laughs> so uh, she's doing a, she did a second fellowship in oncology at NCI. She's board certified in internal medicine, endocrinology, and oncology. diabetes, and metabolism, and is board eligible in oncology. Well, no board certified for oncology. <laughs> <laughs> so she's going to talk today about pediatric cancer, cancer predisposition syndrome. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, I did a lot of training, let's put it that way, years and years of schooling and fellowships. Um, so I just want to ask a question. So how many of you are post doctoral fellows. Okay, and how many of you are clinical fellows? Okay, not that many clinical fellows. Okay, um, so my talk is, uh, we're going to talk about cancer predisposition syndromes and some of the work that we do at the NCI and the pediatric oncology branch. Just to let you know, most of this talk is clinical, but I'm happy and welcome any ideas from this. Uh, you know, you're, the future is bright as by seeing all of you. So we need you guys to advance the science and all these different um, uh, tumors. I'm the director also of the Rare Tumor Clinic and my area of expertise is endocrine malignancies, mainly neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract and lung, as well as adrenal tumors. Um, so we'll discuss a little bit about childhood cancer. So um, childhood cancer is relatively rare. There are approximately 12,000 uh, cases annually that affects children in ages, uh, since they're born until the age of 14, and then it's also reported uh, 1,200 days annually. How, compared to the adults um, uh, population that die of cancers, we can see that um, um, there are a much larger number. Um, and in, in the pediatric pop, uh, population, cancer is the second leading cause of death among children. And we can see here that the most common, the first common cause of death in children is accidents followed by cancer, followed by other uh, congenital anomalies and heart disease, et cetera. But just to show you the incidence of cancer in pediatric population, as well as knowing that it's the second most common uh, cause of um, death. So I'm just going to, um, this is the most common childhood cancers per year. As we can see here, the most common is leukemia, followed by the CNS brain cancers, followed by neuroblastoma, which is also a rare, uh, considered neuroendocrine tumor as well. And we can see that there's other cancers, non Hodgkin lymphoma, wounds, tumors, bones, and Hodgkin's disease rather myosarcoma. One of my area of expertise is thyroid cancers, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that and what we're doing at the NCI. Um, so, uh, so all cancers, um, um, there are different kind of cancers depending on the age group as well. And as you know, and I'm sure during this course, they talk about the different treatments as well to treat various cancer, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and stem cell transplantation, and now with the new era of immunotherapy. So that's something that, you know, we can also discuss about that. So as we can see, I'm mentioning a few of the um, immunotherapy treatments. And one of the CAR T cells is less approved for the treatment of leukemia. Um, so we have monoclonic antibodies. Does anybody can give me an example of what a monoclonic antibody is? Anybody? Give an example. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, truth is one of them. One other one. Anybody? Trastuzumab as well. 
So that's another one. So those are different. A monoclonal antibody is basically something that we can target and we can treat as well. So trastuzumab targets HER2, uh, Keytruda or Pemperlizumab targets PDL1. So those are type of monoclonal antibodies as well. And these are the type of immunotherapy. Uh, oncolytic viral therapy, cancer vaccines, we developed at the NCI a cancer vaccine at tar tar targeting CEA. And then we have, of course, the CAR T cell therapy and other type of immunotherapy. Um, this is just to show you that the advances in pediatric drug development, and as well as in the adults, if we can target something that can be treated that can also has a benefit, clinical benefit as well. Uh, Crisitinib is a drug that has been approved for small cell lung cancer, targets ALK, but it's also um, um, uh, approved for anaplastic um, um, T cell leukemia as well, and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Uh, we also have other drugs, for example, danetuximab that targets BD2 for neuroblastoma. Now, one thing that has changed the view of different solid tumors in childhood is like the findings of the TRK function mutations in solid tumors. And now with this drug that has been approved for any solid tumors that target this mutation, um, this, this mutation has been found in small cell lung cancer. It also has been found in thyroid cancer as well. So as we can see, if there's something that we can target as well, they can also see clinical benefit as well. Something that I work a lot here at the NIH is about medullary cancer and trying to develop other treatment options as well for medullary cancer. But there has been two approved agents for the treatment of advanced or unresectable medullary cancer, such as bandetinib, I'm sorry for the misspelling here, cabosantinib as well, and so forth. Um, so, and now something to keep in mind is that in the earlier years, uh, 1992 to 2005, only 5% of all clinical trials has been approved for pediatrics, but now in the last um, uh, seven to eight years, approximately 16 or almost 17% of all phase one trials has been now have a clinical efficacy in childhood cancer. And that's something that at least from the um, um, uh, people that treat uh, pediatric cancer, some of the things that uh, we encounter is that in clinical trials, usually the age is 18 or above. Sometimes we don't include kids. Uh, and I think we wanted, at least at the NCEI, we wanted to include kids younger, like 15 or 12 years old, because we see in, if there is clinical benefit in adult, why not include younger patients? But that's something that at least we're trying to discuss in the pediatric oncology branch is discussing also with the FDA to try to include younger patients on various clinical trials at the NCEI because of its clinical benefit. So um, something to uh, discuss is about the burden of childhood cancer, because it not only includes the child, but it's also the parents and the siblings. Um, and during, if somebody, a child is diagnosed with cancer, we have to have a support not only for the child, but also for the family as well. Um, there is numerous issues that has uh, arise during the treatment of childhood cancer and dealing with this burden. And one of them is to how to deal with it, how to tell a child that you have a cancer and some of them it may not be a curable cancer. So how we discuss that with the kid. Um, how discuss with the dealing with the scheduling changes when the kids trying to go to schools and they wanted to live a normal life. How do we deal with that? How do we educate the family as well for that? Uh, dealing with hospitalizations, blood draws, imaging studies, appearance, they lose their hair when they're young, and there's something that they deal with, especially when they are with their classmates and they don't look alike, all of that causes stress in the child. Uh, anxiety, depression, and that, that can also happen in adults as well. And also whenever the parents sometimes focus on the child that has the need, but then what happened with the siblings, the siblings feel abandoned, all of that, you know, kind of has this constant struggle even parental relationship as well. And that's something that we need to also address as well in the treatment of childhood cancer. And then, uh, so barbership. Some of these child that were diagnosed with leukemia, now that we have a cure for leukemia, they're diagnosed in the childhood. And then after that, dealing with the late effects of the toxicities of the chemotherapy, and then and, uh, dealing with childhood cancer survivors and so for um, and also something that we need to understand here, and that's where my talk goes, is about this uh, survivor guidelines that are available for the children's oncology group, but as well how to treat and how to deal with these cancer predisposition syndromes, and that's what I'm going to talk about because a good percentage of childhood cancer is associated with uh, with cancer predisposition syndromes, and you may be familiar with some of them, and we'll talk more about that.
So what is cancer predisposition syndrome? Uh, it's caused by the germline mutations, uh, which also increase the risk of developing cancer. It's usually caused by an activated mutation of a gene that promotes tumor growth. That's also known as oncogene, or an inactivated mutation of a gene that normally prevents tumors from forming, and that's a tumor suppressor gene. Um, and germline mutation in these tumors can often have significant, they can don't necessarily have manifestations too as well. So we have somebody that have a mutation and a germline mutation, but even though they may have it in every cell in their body and they can carry a risk for cancer in their lifetime, they don't necessarily develop tumors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so why is it important? Because as we discussed earlier, up to 14% of all pediatric cancers are associated with cancer predisposition syndrome. There are a lot of over 500 known cancer predisposition syndrome and different syndromes. However, we're not going to talk about the 500 cancer predispositions here. We're just going to discuss a few of them um, that may have also clinical impact as well. Um, and then it's important to identify cancer predisposition syndrome. Why? Because you can alter the treatment for an active cancer. It allows surveillance for different tumors because these cancer predisposition syndrome, they have different tumor types and also can identify the risk, uh, uh, family, family members that are at risk, and also um, allow for a productive counseling as well. And we talked a little bit about that. So let's discuss a case first. So we have a 14-year-old male that was diagnosed with a large right-sided neck mass. A subsequent thyroid ultrasound uh, reported a multinodal argoider and several surrounding cell deletions. CT neck showed a large hyperenhancing right thyroid mass. An FNA, a fine needle aspiration of that thyroid mass uh, of, um, showed epithelial cells consistent with hyperchromatic nuclei with the spindle cell features consistent with medullary tary cancer. So this is the neck ultrasound. We can see the 1.8 centimeter solid mass here. And then we have the spindle cell features here and that's consistent with medullary tary cancer. So what do you want to do next? next? Do you want to repeat the thyroid ultrasound in six months? Do you want to refer him to surgery now? Do you want to measure the calcitonin, CAs, and plasma metanephrines? Do you want to obtain genetic counseling? Or do you want to measure thyroglobulin's levels? So do, what do you want to do? Tell us any answer. What do you want to do? Huh? Can I hear you? C. That's the correct answer. Why is that? That's very good. Why is that? <laughs> so this is, we're thinking about medullary tray cancer. We talk about cancer predisposition syndromes. And one of the things that we want to look in somebody so young is about the association with um, MEN2A or MEN2B. And we'll talk briefly about that. Now you can see that his calcitonin was high, very high. You can see that's the normal level. CA is also elevated, which is also marker for medullary tray cancer. Oops. So I think you saw the answer. So what do you want to do next? You want to send him to surgery now? You want to, huh? what? C. Why is that? Why do you want to do C? What are you thinking with this calcitonin is so high? You want to make sure that the patient doesn't have any metastasis in the other side of the body, right? So that's the reason why you want to make sure that in a patient that have a calcitonin greater than 500, you wanted to do also imaging procedures to rule out any metastatic disease. And that's basically what is in the standardized guidelines for any patient with medullary tary cancer. So we continue with the case. So the patient underwent total pterodactomy and lymph node dissection was resected. So and pathology was consistent with as we discussed, medullary tary cancer, they confirm the diagnosis of medullary tary cancer. And as we can see, this is the positive staining, the how it looks like in a patient that has medullary tary cancer. So um, something to understand about thyroid cancer that is different from other cancers um, is that especially for the differentiatory cancer, I mean, I don't want to get you confused because we're talking about medullary tary cancer, but I just wanted to tell you the difference between differentiatory cancer where H is a prognostic factor. So a patient younger than 55 years old do better than a patient older than 55. But medullary tary cancer doesn't have an age as a differentiated factor. And there's something in the endocrine oncology we need to understand about that. So these are the different type of tary cancer. So the most common is 
what we call differentiated thyroid cancer that accounts for almost eight, for eight, 88% of all thyroid cancers. And we have uh, papillary thyroid cancer and we have follicular thyroid cancer. And now we know and we understand that papillary thyroid cancer, they have different mutations that has been also associated with um, uh, prognosis as well, BRAF mutation. So remember that I mentioned earlier about this one, the TRK, somebody was paying attention. What is that, TRK? And how do we treat it? Somebody was paying attention? <laughs> yes, yes, that's right, yep. So that's the TRK mutation and that's also found in papillary thyroid cancer and if that mutation is found, there's a very a, a treatment that can be quite effective as well. And then we have follicular artery cancer that has other type of mutations as well. And that's also as well associated with prognosis. Now we discussed about medullary artery cancer. So most of the medullary artery cancer are um, sporadic. Uh, however, uh, of the sporadic, and let me just go back a little bit. So you have 100% medullary artery cancer, 75% are sporadic, but out of those sporadics, half of those patients has somatic red. 25% are germline, and that has been associated with cancer predisposition syndromes, either uh, MEN2A and MEN2B, and we'll talk more about that. And less common um, is anaplastic dairy cancer, very aggressive, very, very malignant type of cancer. It's very aggressive, very bad prognosis, uh, anaplastic dairy cancer. So this is just to show you the different age and the presentations of thyroid cancers. Uh, we can see the older kids, so we can see each color is different age, uh, zero to four years old, five to nine. But if you can see that differentiated thyroid cancer is of course later um, as a teenager, whereas the medullary thyroid cancer, as we can see here, occurs earlier. And one of the things is because it has 100% penetrance in these cancer predisposition syndromes, and besides associated with medullary thyroid cancer, it has other tumor manifestations, and we'll talk more about that. So going back to the history, so paternal grandmother has a history of hypertension. I don't know, maybe this, the paternal grandmother has a few chromocytoma and we didn't know. Uh, paternal grandfather with prostate cancer, maternal grandmother with history of coronary artery disease and bladder cancer, and then we have a maternal grandmother with herisal leukemia, uh, and for some reason, he underwent sur she underwent surgery and unknown what, what kind of, I think it was hormonal goiter, if I remember well, on this patient. Um, so patient's parents are healthy, no history of cancer, but he has two brothers, 28 and 25 years old, and they're also healthy. When they uh, did the genetic testing, he was tested positive for the red proto-oncogene, NI18, which is associated with multiple endocrinoplasia type 2B. And most of the MEN2B are found sporadic, however, 25% of course, they're in families as well. So, and just to mention here, that if somebody that is red positive because it's a cancer predisposition syndrome, we need to also screen for pheochromocytoma. Does anybody know what is a pheochromocytoma? It's a, a, it's a tumor of the adrenal medulla that produces epinephrine. So anything, whenever you have, you feel anxious, you start to sweat, your hands start to sweat, that's an effect of your adrenaline. And your body produces normal condition because it's a defense mechanism. However, if there is a tumor in the adrenal gland that produces this excess of hormones, those symptoms get really exacerbated. And because of that, your blood pressure goes very high, you start sweating uh, like out of the blue without any strenuous activities, so, and that has a significant cardiovascular effect. So that's the reason why if you wanna send somebody for surgery, the first thing that you need to do is to make sure that this patient doesn't have a pheochromocytoma. And uh, because of the sake of time, this is what the old classification will discuss now, the newer classification, the difference between um, sporadics and hereditary medullary artery cancer. We said that the most common is the sporadic. Uh, we found approximately 25% up to 30% can be associated with the germline mutation on the red front, the alcohol gene. Um, so we have, in terms of the multiple endocrinoplasia type 2A, we have a different clinical presentations of this multiple endocrinoplasia. We discuss about medullary artery cancer. We discuss about pheochromocytoma. And there's another presentation that is less common on those patients, which is primary hyper parathyroidism. Does anybody know what is primary hyperparathyroidism? What is hyperpara? So basically your parathyroid glands is the, regulates your calcium in your body. When you have a tumor, it can cause excess of calcium. 
So your calcium is very high. So we talk about what is medullary thyroid cancer, we talk about PEO, then we talk about primary hyperpara. So in terms of MEN to B, uh, medullary thyroid cancer is the most common. PEO chromocytoma can occur and have the patients, and then they have other clinical manifestations of medullary thyroid cancer. So this is just to mention that there is a genotype phenotype correlation in hereditary medullary cancer, depending on what, whenever they do genetic testing, depending on what colon is mutated, they can have different clinical presentations as well. Most common uh, mutation on MEN2A is 634 mutation, and that's the most common association with medullary PEM primary hyperparathyroidism. And then if we have somebody who has MEN2 B, the most common mutation is 918 mutation. However, this cotton or this mutation is associated with more aggressive form of medullary thyroid cancer. So these are the different clinical manifestations of MEN2B. So this is what uh, we, they have like these mucosal neuromas here. You can see here the, the characteristics of mucosal neuromas. Um, they can also have uh, 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 kyphosis and lordosis as one of the things that is characteristics on um, uh, MEN2B. This is this skin changes is called um, cutaneous lichen amyloidosis, and that's common as well on MEN2B. One thing that we have seen in patients with MEN2B is that they have this what we call uh, uh, pulmonary blebs. So, um, and that's something that we have seen unknown why this is happening, but we see very common pulmonary blebs. And because of this clinical presentation that happened on MEN to be with these pulmonary bleds, one of our research that we have done is to understand about the pulmonary function of these patients with MEN to be. Um, and here, um, this is some published data, and we're basically study all the patients with MEN to be. It's a rare type of cancer. Um, and then to, we study, we did pulmonary functions on patients that were at baseline, and we have a continuous follow up pulmonary function test and patients that were that were exposed to that tyrosine kinase inhibitor. We mentioned earlier that there was two approved agents for medullary thyroid cancer. One is pendetinib and cabosantinib. That was earlier in the presentation. And also we have the patients that have uh, the RTKI naive. And as we can see, the, uh, we see also uh, the, the, the deficiency on the pulmonary uh, diffusion capacities. And what is the diffusion capacity? It's also known as the DLCO. It determines how much oxygen travels from your alveoli to the lungs, to the bloodstream. And so, and sometimes in patients with TKI naive, as we can see here, they also have a mild to moderate um, abnormalities on the diffusion capacity without being on the tyrosine kinase. And why I mentioned this is because this tyrosine kinase can also cause pulmonary fibrosis, and this fibrosis in the lungs can also decrease the DLCO. So that's why even in patients that did not receive treatment for the cancer, we can see that there is also and impair on DLCO. So we don't know why this is happening, but this can also tell me as a doctor treating cancer, a child treating cancer, if what kind of treatments I need to give a patient with, um, uh, with advanced thyroid cancer. Um, so this is just to mention that in, uh, uh, in terms of when somebody is diagnosed with MEN2A or MEN2B, one of the things that is recommended is that if a patient has um, a high risk to develop either MEN2A and MEN2B, all those patients need to have a thyroidectomy at birth. One is diagnosed, we need to have thyroidectomy, and that's the most common when they have the night 18 mutation, which is associated mainly with MEN2B. If the patient has MEN2A, we discussed earlier, they have the most common uh, 634 mutation. They, you start screening for medullary thyroid cancer at age of um, as, as uh, three years old, but the, the prophylactic thyroidectomy, it has to be done before the age of five. And as we discussed earlier, pheochromocytoma is something that needs to be also uh, discussed, uh, needs to be screened as well. And depending on the mutation, it's different uh, screening that needs to be done based on the standardized guidelines. And this is just to show you here that uh, is if the patients have the age appropriate thyroidectomy, they do better survival improve in those patients compared to the ones that did not uh, receive the thyroidectomy. However, um, even um, patients that have metastatic disease, knowing that this patient has an indolent cord disease, 
patients um, die after 10 years of age. And because of that, one of the things that we're working is to develop new treatment options in the pediatric oncology branch with the natural history study for MEN 2B and MEN 2A. We wanted to develop more treatment options for these patients. And this is just kind of like a, a picture of different management of, medul of medullary arterial cancer. One thing that the difference, I know that you discussed earlier about breast cancer, so the management is different. Breast cancer is more aggressive. Uh, it's not something that we have the time to do surgery here or radiate here. So medullary arterial cancer is more indolent. These patients live for longer time. So and that's why, because of that, we can have a, a, a more um, treatment related to their disease specific. Sometimes if they have only liver disease, maybe they can benefit for ablation or embolization of the liver. If they have bone metastasis, may, they can benefit uh, for um, bone medicines by phosphonase to prevent any fractures on these patients. We discussed earlier about systemic therapy and also because of the indolent course, is not wrong to also recommend in these patients with medullary cancer a clinical trial as a first line. However, for breast cancer, we have standardized guidelines. You can know for a patient that was diagnosed with metastatic dairy cancer, a clinical trial, because we don't know the benefit in these patients. And survival is important. So that's one thing that's just to mention the difference when you saw earlier breast cancer versus medullary cancer. This is a paper that came from the uh, pediatric oncology branch. Um, so this is just um, reporting the outcomes of children and adolescents with advanced medullary cancer using bandetanib. And we can see that the response, um, I don't know if somebody, I mean, we explained about the water plot plots. Uh, do you know if anybody can tell me what that means, the water plot plot? Anybody? So basically, and just here, I'm so happy that you're here so we can always uh, add any more information, but basically each line is a, is a patient here. And basically uh, this is the best response rate on the tumor. So minus 20, that means that the, the tumors decrease by 20%, by 40%, by 60%. And this is basically the best response of the tumor. So one line is each line here is a patient and then basically it's the best response rate when the tumor decreases in size. And that's basic, we can see here with this bandetinib that the tumors did respond that, uh, uh, the patients, the tumors responded well in bandetinib, but one thing is that response were durable. So we can see here the time of in response and those have durable responses as well. So now we finish about medullary artery cancer right now. We'll go back a little bit about that, just checking on the time. And now well, let's go with case two. So this is a 24 year old Greek female uh, presented to the NIH with a medical history of hypertension for seven years. So this is already seven years of hypertension and the, and the primary care physician only placed an lisinopril for the blood pressure. They increase it from once a day to twice a day. So she has anxiety, diaphoresis, episodic shortness of breath, chest heaviness, constipation, 20 pounds weight loss in one year. Abdominal ultrasound and CT scan show the six centimeter abdominal mass. CT scan guided biopsy uh, was suggested of a parikin glioma. And we can see this is a um, mass that is, uh, was found on the retroperitoneum. So do you know anybody the difference between pheochromocytoma and parikin glioma by any chance? No. So we, as earlier, in the adrenal gland, which are your glands on top of the kidney, produces three hormones, aldosterone, uh, cortisol, and adrenaline. So any tumor in the adrenal gland is called pheochromocytoma. Anything outside the adrenal gland is called paraganglioma. The reason why is because your nervous system is everywhere in your body because you have certain neurons that controls your heart rate, certain neurons that controls your bowel movement. So, and because of that, you know, they can have all these neurons can be anywhere in the body. So any tumor outside the adrenal gland is called paraganglioma, but it's usually the same histology, histology it's just the location. So the only history is that she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis a year earlier. These are the only medications that she had. Mother has a history of pancreatic cancer. Father was a heavy smoker. Has two brothers, one with hypertension and one with Hashimoto's. There is no history of uh, pheochromocytomas or paraganglioms. So what do you want to do next? Who wants to do plasma free metanephrines or urine metanephrines, free metanephrines? 
who wants to do a Galleon scan. What is a Galleon scan? I don't know what is a Galleon scan. What is an MIBG scan? Uh, do you want to do genetic testing? Uh, do you want to do some medications to prevent that excess of metanephrine? Or do you want to give another medication called a beta blocker? All of those two med last medications are medications for the blood pressure. So what do you want to do? So this is a pheochromocytoma. So you want to test for the metanephrine because the adrenal gland is the one that is producing this metanephrine. You can measure in the plasma, you can measure in the urine. Um, and that's, and you can see here that chromogranin is a tumor marker for neuroendocrine tumor, but you can see how his norepinephrine, look at that, this is so high, 14,000, the, no, the reference range is only 112 to 750. So you can see, imagine having this amount of norepinephrine and metanephrine in your body, your blood pressure goes very high, your heart rate goes very high, everything is exacerbated. So that's one of the things that you need to keep in whenever a patient has pheochromocytoma. This is a very important uh, uh, evaluation uh, for to diagnose pheochromocytoma. So we did a CT scan of the NIH, and you can see confirmed this retroperitoneal mass. And just to let you know what a pheo, so pheochromocytomas are neuroendocrine tumors. As we discussed earlier, they're characterized by the synthesis of catecholamines, they store, they release, and also it's important, it's one of the defense mechanisms whenever you have uh, symptoms of anxieties or uh, your hands sweat and so forth. So there is important genetic facts that we need to know about pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma. So 35 to 40% are inherited, so from germline mutation. So that's important. And we discussed earlier about cancer predisposition syndromes. 15% uh, of these pheos and paras has a somatic mutation. And there are now more than 20 genes that has been associated with pheos chromocytomas, and it's considered the most hereditary endocrine tumors. So the, we discussed this earlier, the difference between pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma. So these are your adrenal glands, as you can see, it's on the top of the kidneys. So any uh, excess of hormones or tumor, this is called pheochromocytoma. That's the most common presentation. And then anything outside the adrenal gland, as we can see, this is the paraganglia change. That's called a paraganglioma. And it can happen anywhere in the head and neck here paraganglioma, the head and neck, as you can see, there are structures in the neck area that uh, these tumors, when they grow, has a significant um, uh, uh, local invasion and sometimes very difficult to resect because of the area. And then we have a paraganglioma anywhere from the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And as we discussed earlier, one of the things that is important to know is because of this hormone that is produced excessively, that can cause a heart attack, it can cause many complications, cardiovascular complications, and that's important as well. Uh, there are many different genes associated with hereditary pheochromocytomas and paracangliomas. These are the most common genes, BHL. Um, I don't know if any of you works on the BHL here, uh, but MEN2. Then we have succinate dehydrogenase mutations that has been changed. The, metabolism of cancer has been associated with other cancers as well. NF1, this, the pediatric oncology branch has a natural history study and treatment protocol for NF1, and we'll discuss more about that. There are five minor, minor susceptibility genes. So we have, these are less common than the major, so that's why it's called major, because they're most common than the five minor susceptibility genes. Uh, so the most, these, the five major accounts for most of the 90% uh, of all hereditary fears and chromocytomas and paragangliomas and these less common genes, less than 10%. So one of the things I always say to my fellows is that when we, you, when we were in medical school or learning biochemistry or any, and we're talking about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, there used to be the rule of tens, like 10% of the population, 10% was hereditary, 10% bilateral, but that's no longer the case anymore because now there has been, especially in the last 10 years, there has been more discoveries of these different tumor uh, mutations that has been associated with pheos and paras, gangliomas. So the HIF2 alpha mutation was a gene that was discovered here at the NIH. It's a gain of function mutation that is associated with paraganglioma as well as polycythemia. So polycythemia is when your concentration of RBC is higher and because of that your hemoglobin is very high. Um, HRAS mutation is approximately 7% of sporadic pheochromocytoma has an HRAS mutation. Uh, fumarate hydratase mutation, that's something that is on the Krebs cycle, um, has been associated with multiple paracangliomas. Maladehydrogenase mutation, another enzyme in the Krebs cycle, 
also with multiple malignant paragangliomas. And there is a new gene that was discovered recently about the EPAS1 mutations that has been associated with fear of paragangliomas and cyanotic heart disease. So we talk about multiple endocrinoplasia type two. So we have, I, I think earlier, we discussed about medullary cancer, MEN2A, uh, and then uh, also MEN2B. So we discussed earlier that MEN2A is associated with medullary cancer, pheochromocytoma, as well as hyperparathyroidism, whereas MEN2B, uh, also medullary cancer, pheochromocytoma, as well as different characteristics of the um, uh, clinical characteristics associated with MEN2B. And as we can see, mucosal neuromas is one characteristic of MEN2B. BHL. So that's another cancer predisposition syndrome um, associated with pheochromocytoma and rarely paragangioma. Um, up to 25% of patients with BHL may develop pheochromocytoma. And of the patients that develop pheochromocytoma, they have bilateral disease. They're very large tumor. They're very vascular tumors. But also BHL has been associated with other tumors as well. We discussed about cancer predisposition syndrome earlier what it is. And screening for other tumors is important whenever a patient is positive for that specific mutation. Like, for example, BHL has been associated with CNS hemangioblastomas, retinal hemangioblastoma. That's more common than pheochromocytoma because pheochromocytoma is rare on those patients. Pancreatic cysts, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, Kidney cancer is very common, and here at the NIH and CI, we have a group that's basically studying kidney cancer associated with DHL um, and so forth. Um, so I just wanted to touch briefly about the NF1 because that's a big, uh, big part of the pediatric oncology branch and the efforts about NF1 in the pediatric oncology branch. So it's also, it's, uh, NF1 is the most common single gene disorder. Um, it's a mutation in the neuro 5 bromine which is a tumor suppression gene, and we discussed that earlier. So these are the very characteristic findings of NF1. They have the cafe OLED spots that we can see here. These are the cafe OLED spots here. Uh, they look like little moles. Um, they can also have plexiform neurofibromas. Uh, here, as we can see, this is a, uh, a plexiform neurofibroma. They can, it, it arises from the uh, nerve sheets, and they can grow, and they can cause a lot of deformity and capacity. So it's very difficult to move the arms. Um, and, um, and that's something that I'm mentioning here. They can have this plexum of neurofibromas can become very malignant as well, um, and they can be very aggressive too. Uh, and that's another tumor associated with NF1, which is a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. They can also have leukemias too. Um, so other manifestations, uh, CNS, uh, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal too, endocrine, uh, only two to 5% of NF1 may uh, present with pheochromocytoma. So the pheochromocytoma NF1 is very rare. So we can, this is what a plexum of neurofibroma may look like. We discussed about the cafeolet spots and we can have the multiple neurofibromas as we can see. And these neurofibromas can be very painful too. So uh, we discussed that the plexum of neurofibromas involve multiple, involve multiple nerve fascicles and branches. Um, it's uh, those plexum of neurofibromas contain swan cells, which is a type of CNS cells, fibroblasts, mast cells. Uh, they can, they they can has low growth, but they can grow uh, uh, very large. And one thing is because it comes from the nerve, sometimes it's very difficult to resect those tumors without having complications of this. Um, they can also have disfigurement, as we can see here. This is the lady that has the plexum or neurofibromas on the face, and we can see how they can form, uh, they can disfigure somebody. Uh, they can also have functional impairment because of this. So, and you can see this is a whole body MRI. This is like multiple plexical neurofibromas, and you can see how it looks like. Uh, and also they can see around the eye areas as well. So, and because of the understanding the pathology of this, uh, flexible neurofibroma and NF1, one of the things that is associated with the pathogenesis is that MET kinase pathway on these patients. And there is a MET inhibitor called selumetinib. And here at the NIH, uh, especially the pediatric oncology branch, did clinical studies 
And based on that, they have the longest and uh, natural history study with patients with NF1. And when they use this MAKE inhibitor based on the pathogenesis of the, how these tumors may develop, um, they saw that by using a MAKE inhibitor, which is lumetinib, there's a shrinkage of the tumor. And we discussed earlier about the water flow plot, and we can see how the significant um, the shrinkage of the tumor here. Even with lower dose, we can see how the tumors decrease in size. And we can see here the picture of positive form of fibromas, the how over time they, uh, we can see the changes in how the, the tumor reduces in size. This is also published data, uh, but the, the first phase one was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the phase two, it's been published. Dr. Brigida Wiedemann is the PI in the study. And we discussed earlier about what the water flow plot is, and as we can see the significant response that we see with these patients that were on telemetinib. And as we can see so earlier, these tumors that were causing some impairment, they get better by using and this durable response as well. And that's something exciting from the pediatric oncology branch when they developed and they put, they saw the clinical benefit of telemetinib. So that's NF1 and that's uh, kind of like a big part of the pediatric oncology branch. So now let's go back. Earlier I mentioned that some of the mutations associated with Theopara is the succinate dehydrogenase mutation. And this is a very nice figure because that kind of helps us understand the uh, pathogenesis and of this, how these tumors develop. But uh, this is, uh, and I don't know if anybody, since you are scientist, postdoctoral fellows, like if anybody knows about the Krebs cycle, but this is, this is the electron transfer chain. And so, and that's basically what is responsible for the, your ATP production, your energy production. So if we have a mutation, within any of the enzymes that are responsible for this energy production, which is a succinate dehydrogenase complex. The succinate dehydrogenase complex has many subunits, the A, B, C, and D. But when there is a mutation on this complex or the gene that's associated with this complex, so what happened is that in the Krebs cycle, succinate cannot be converted to fumarate. So there is going to be an accumulation of succinate in the body, in the cells. And this accumulation of succinate, what it's going to cause is a pseudo-hypoxic state. So normally they have a certain amount of oxygen that needs to be under the cell. But when you have this mutation, there's going to be a pseudo-hypoxic state. And what happened is that that will stabilize this hypoxia inducible factor. In normoxic conditions, this hypoxia inducible factor, this needs to be degraded. So, but when it's not degraded, this stabilize and that factor basically caused the increase in angiogenesis, cell proliferation, invasions, invasion, and that's basically the pathogenesis of the development of these tumors associated with fear and para. But not only that, these mutations in the succinate hydrogenase has been associated with kidney cancer, pituitary tumors, and so forth. So there are other uterine lyomyomas as well, so it has been associated with other tumors. I don't want to go in, because of the sake of time, I don't want to go into detail, but basically here, um, so there is um, different, we discussed that in every subunit that uh, of this uh, succinate dehydrogenase complex, now we understand that they have different clinical presentations. It's germline uh, mutation, it's an autosomal dominant mutation. Does anybody know what I mean is autosomal dominant mutation? Anybody? Because we have the autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. So autosomal dominant is a 50% chance that the offsprings can have the mutation. Independent, if there is um, so, uh, uh, um, succinate hydrogenase mutation D is a paternal transmission, meaning it's mitochondrial imprinting. That means that it's, it's still 50% chance that you may have the mutation, but if the mutation comes from the mom, the offsprings cannot have the mutation. If the mutation comes from the dad, there's still 50% chance that the offsprings will have the mutation, but they will develop the tumors. So that's the difference between the genetics of these different mutations. Um, so one thing that we are studying here at the NIH is the, succinate, the clinical manifestations of succinate dehydrogenase B. Um, so is, of all the succinate dehydrogenase mutations, this is more aggressive. Uh, you can see it has a high malignancy risk, but one thing is also associated with kidney cancer as well. Succinate dehydrogenase B mutation uh, developed mainly paragangliomas on the head and neck area. Uh, not as the malignancy risk is not as high as the succinate dehydrogenase B mutation, but it's also associated with kidney cancer too. So um, this is also a paper that came 
from our group uh, that uh, the, uh, what is the risk of development fatigue disease in somebody that has the mutation. And uh, this was a retrospective study. Uh, and basically the study, they look at all the patients that had uh, metastatic disease or they have a, a fetal chromocytoma at the time of presentation uh, in patients younger than uh, 20 years old. And what they found is of the 32 patients, um, so they found that most of them were 71% has, or 72% has succinic dehydrogenase D. And uh, uh, 10%, almost 10% has succinic dehydrogenase D. Others were NF1, other was DHL. But one important uh, fact from this one is that patients that developed, that had succinic dehydrogenase mutation, they developed metastatic disease earlier compared to the SDHD, which is important to know because based on that, now we know that there is some guidelines that was, this paper, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference here, but this paper was published a few months ago that this uh, patient, the, whether if the patient has a succinate hydrogenase mutation, you start biochemical, uh, clinical and biochemical assessment earlier compared to patients that have other succinate hydrogenase mutation D, C, or A. So because they develop tumors earlier and they can have metastatic disease earlier in life compared to SDHD or C or A. So this is an important thing that we need to know about this. Now, let's go back to phase two. So this patient underwent exploratory laparotomy uh, after it's important because of the, ex uh, we discussed about this excess of hormone causing cardiovascular effects. So this patient needs to have proper medication Whenever they go to surgery, you want to decrease the risk of any cardiovascular complications and myocardial infarction. Um, so the pathology was consistent with metastatic paraganglioma. And then this patient has a positive margin. So what do you want to do here? Something that this patient didn't have earlier. What do you want to do? You want to do it might be a scan. So what is that? The, the scan that is for Fiopara. Gallium scan is a very dotted scan. It's a scan that has been proven more sensitive for pheochromocytoma, the diagnosis of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Do you want to do CT? Or well, let's follow this patient up, or do you want to do genetic testing? So let's do, in this case, let's do genetic testing. This patient haven't had a genetic testing, right? She's very young. So every pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas are guaranteed to do genetic testing. So, and, and that's why we discussed earlier about other syndromes associated with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. So, and basically you're going to test the gene based on the clinical presentation of the patient. If the patient has, as we discussed, DHL, has all these different tumors, CNS to mandibastoma, kidney, uh, kidney cancer, if they have any of those tumors, then you can test for that. Um, and depending on what clinical presentation they have, then they may reflect what clinical testing that you may wanna do in those patients. So for the head and neck, so we discussed it's very common. So SDHD has been associated with head and neck preganglioma, and for any metastatic on a young patient, always test for SDHD. So that's important. But if there is not any significant syndromic or familial presentation, so additional information may be needed, and that's when your biochemical phenotypes testing for all these hormones may be important. Uh, but so just for the sake of time, this is not something that most you're likely going to use in your work, but that's something important. And as we can see, this patient underwent genetic testing and she was found to have an SDHD mutation positive. So these patients, um, it's important that all these patients, whenever they found to have a mutation, they need to have a whole body MRI, a whole body scans, because as we discussed earlier, they can have tumors any other place in their body. So, but also imaging studies is important as well, functional imaging studies. And uh, like other neuroendocrine tumors, that's where the dot that they scan, as I mentioned earlier, plays a very important role, and I'll tell you why. But, uh, but patients, any tumor that is greater than five centimeter or any paraganglioma requires a, a functional imaging studies. Um, this patient had a, C, a CT scan that showed that the patient had um, uh, metastatic disease already in the liver, very young to have metastatic disease. So what do you want to do? And that's when your gallium scan, and we discuss about the gallium scan. So patients that have diagnosed with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, this is an MIVG scan. So you can see, well, it's not very good. If DOPA scan is a scan that's only available at the NIH, it's not available outside of the NIH. Um, so we can see that we see different tumors. And then this is the FDG PET scan. It's very used, uh, I think, on animal you know, experiment, uh, 
studies, you also may do different imaging modalities, and FDG is one of them. But look at what happened with the Judoagdalian scan. So you can see the difference between the, 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 dif, uh, the uh, different imaging modalities. And what happened is that these paragon gliomas express so much statin receptors in the cell. And because they express so much statin receptors in the cells, you can see that when you inject the radioisotope, it lights out like a Christmas tree. So this test has now changed the way we diagnose these endocrine tumors, that as well, not only for the gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but as well for the pheochromocytomas and paraganglioms as well. So that's a, an example of this. So this is kind of like a whole guideline on when to do imaging studies, but I will say that's kind of like old because now with the Gallium scan and we have this available at the NIH and we're doing a lot of studies using the Gallium scan for the diagnosis of these neuroendocrine tumors, you can see the difference on this. Um, so that's an important thing to know for these patients in the diagnostic evaluation and workup that this patient needs to have a Gallium scan. Um, and depending if they have a genetic mutation or not, sometimes it guides you also what imaging study needs to be done. But I will say that in terms of all of them, I think Gallium scan is a pretty good sensitive scan. And this is a study that showed that Gallium scan is better in F than FG PET scan for not only for succinic dehydrogenase mutation, but also for patients that did not have any germline mutation as well. And we can see that the uh, rate to identify lesions as well as sensitivity is higher compared to FG PET scan, or even sometimes better compared to the other functional imaging modalities. And this is how we, uh, this is just a treatment algorithm of those pheochromocytomas, as well as medullary cancer. It has an indolent course. It's not rapidly growing tumors. Some of them can. Toxinity so dehydrogenase mutation B can have a more aggressive course and more aggressive tumor growth as well. But one of the things that whenever, as an oncologist treating these tumors, one of the things for when I see a patient with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, first I need to determine what is the growth rate. If it's very slow growing, maybe you want to watch it. If it's moderately growing, now MIVG is an approved agent by the FDA. It was just approved beginning of this year, uh, and that could be an option. However, as we saw earlier, the different scans, MIVG, FDOPA, FDG, Gallium scan, not every patient that has metastatic biopara is positive on the MIVG. So before offering a patient MIVG treatment, you need to make sure that you do a, a, an MIVG scan to make sure if it's positive. If it's negative, you're not going to offer MIVG. And then uh, chemotherapy uh, for the rapidly progressive disease. Now at the NIH, we have the first prospective study. It's ongoing of using Luthothera. Uh, so um, just to go back a little bit what Luthothera is. Um, so the gallium, which I showed you earlier that the, this Pheochromocytoma has expressed so much statin receptors type 2. That's why gallium scan can be so positive. But at the same time, we have the radioactive treatment that targets those receptors, and that's called Luthothera. Um, and that's something that we have available at the NIH. And I'm actually finished earlier. That's good. So what is, uh, what is the pediatric cancer predisposition syndrome? So there are specific recommendations that we saw earlier. All these cancer predisposition syndromes has been associated with different tumors. Um, and then we need to make recommendations based on risk of tumor development. Um, there are various guidelines that have been produced with recommendations about screening and surveillance. And we saw it earlier for the medullary cancer. Remember, we discussed about when to do surgery. When we discussed about uh, a succinic dehydrogenase mutation, we discussed about when to do screening and surveillance. Um, and then, um, and why this is important, because if we're able to diagnose somebody with this cancer predisposition syndromes, so, and if we detect earlier in us, we can intervene as well. Um, and then we can also, um, but there are some challenges as well that we need to understand because sometimes, you know, there's this uh, say that is cancidy. Uh, so meaning that whenever these patients, every time they come from the yearly follow or every six months, you know, they have to have scans and there is always generates a lot of anxiety as well. And that's something that causes significant psychological distress. But also at the same time, uh, especially for pediatric cancer predisposition syndrome, they're rare. And we also develop, uh, even though we discuss about the tumors that doesn't grow as fast, we still need to develop like, therapies that work better for cancer and also determine um, better, um, uh, develop tools to deter cancer earlier as well. So this is, thank you.
Any questions? In, yes, for the uh, metastatic medullary thyroid cancer, you know, you've pointed out that vandetamide uh -huh. uh, was effective. In the childhood cancer, do you notice resistance? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, yep. Like all these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we have seen the mechanism of resistance. Uh, do you know what that means? I mean, just the students, what that means, the mechanism of resistance, anybody? So just, I wanna ask. Well, we've yeah. discussed this previously. Oh, okay, you discussed that previously, okay, sorry. So basically, yes, so yes, we have seen that a lot. And we try, and one of the works that we're doing at the pediatric oncology branch is we're trying to do biopsies as well in pre-treatment and post-treatment to determine that exact mechanism. We don't know why it's happening, that mechanism of resistance, but it's happening all across to various tyrosine kinase. Now, I didn't mention this, but there is a new um, uh, drug that has been very effective for medullary thyroid cancer, um, is the LOXA trial, which is the TRK, uh, the targeted TRK, remember that I mentioned earlier, targeted TRK, larotrectinib, uh, the, um, the kind of like the trial, because we still don't have a specific name for the medullary thyroid cancer, is LOXO. And we have seen patients that have enrolled on those trials that they have a significant catatonin response. It goes like from 10,000 to 50 in, uh, in a period of a month. Uh, and it's correlated also with tumor response. Um, we haven't now one thing to look at those trials and we're going to open that trial is also to see if this is also a tyrosine kinase family, whether there is any resistant mechanism. So far on the phase one study and the phase two study, they have not seen that, but it's something that we, it will be important to see about that. That's correct, that's very good. But we have seen that with the mandatinib and gabazantinib. And even those patients that were on the study, sometimes they were mandatinib, even they have durable response by the time of progression, then we switch them to gabazantinib. Okay, that'll do it. Thank you. Thank you.